Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's session. Thank you very much for joining us. A very warm welcome from Curious Minds. If in the first instance, we could just quickly draw your attention to the slide, which you can hopefully see on your screens at the moment. If you could just keep your microphones turned off for now, please. And um, that would be much appreciated just so that we can minimize any kind of technical disruptions to the session. But please do feel free to kind of say hello, introduce yourself using the chat box function. We'd love to hear from you this morning. Tell us a bit about who you are, where you're from, and what you do. And I think we'll make a start this morning. We've got quite a, a, a small select uh, session, a uh, number of participants on this morning's session. And it looks like most of us have actually joined us now. So we'll make a start to, to this morning's session. If I haven't had the, the pleasure of uh, meeting you before today, my name is Hannah Lambert and I work as the Programmes Coordinator at Curious Minds. And I'm joined on this morning's session by my colleague, Jude Bird, who is our Director of Programmes. I don't know if you want to just quickly say hello to everyone. Morning, people. Delighted <laughs> that you can join us. And we're delighted to have uh, Keith and Grace with us as well from Counterculture, our solicitors. So I'm sure this will be really useful for all of us. Good to welcome you. Thanks very much, Jude. And um, as I'm sure you'll be aware, your, uh, on today's session, we'll be focusing on a beginner's guide to web law. So in a moment, as Jude said there, we'll be introducing you to Keith and uh, Grace, who will be taking us through kind of the main part of today's session. Um, and just looking at who we've got in today's session, we've, we've kind of got a, a bit of a mixture. So some of you um, have kind of um, been with us all the way on these uh, Curious in a Crisis webinars. So apologies if there's going to be some repetition here. Um, but I can see we do have one or two people who may be engaging with us for the first time. So I'd just like to give you a very, very brief um, intro in terms of who Curious Minds is and what we do. So Curious Minds is an arts charity. We are based in the Northwest and we serve the Northwest region. And we exist as an organization to support the engagement of children and young people uh, with arts and cultural education experiences and opportunities. Now, most of the work that we actually carry out isn't uh, direct delivery with those children and young people across the region. Most of the work that we actually do is with professionals like yourselves within the arts and cultural sector and the education sector to ensure that you have the support you need to, to provide that really high quality provision for those children and young people across the Northwest. And most of our work takes uh, in the format of training, events, and we also run a number of different leadership programmes as well. So as I say, today's session is part of a bigger programme called Curious in a Crisis. And this programme was developed um, as our response to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic situation that we have all been experiencing and uh, enduring over these challenging months um, <laughs> since March. Um, and in a slight detour to the other webinars, that if you have experienced the other sessions in Curious in a Crisis, um, this session is more of an active discussion. So we'd really love um, during this session for you to actively participate uh, within the discussions during the session. And Keith will tell you a little bit more about that shortly. So I'll very quickly run through um, what we're hoping to experience over the next hour. So as I say, we'll be here till 11 o'clock this morning and um, Keith uh, will be taking us through the main part of the session. So he will begin with a bit of um, talking from the front and um, just to cover kind of the main content and the main points that you really kind of need to know as part of this beginner's guide to, to web law. And then, as I say, we'll move into some active discussion to really help you get the most value out of today's session. And one of the main reasons that we're, we're encouraging, encouraging this active discussion is, as I say, we're a very small group. So it'd be lovely to hear from you, but also to ensure that you get, you know, the, the most value you can out of these sessions. As I say, if you could just leave your mics on mute for now, just to minimise any technical disruption, and Keith will indicate otherwise when you can um, unmute and kind of participate in the discussion, that would be fab. Um, but we will also make sure that we allocate some time for, for Q&A as well during the session. So if, as Keith is talking, or if as you're going through the discussions, um, any questions kind of uh, crop up that you'd like to ask, please pop those down in the chat box, and I'll be here monitoring the chat box and I'll collate all of those questions and we can pose those to Keith at the end of the session. 
if you do experience any technical issues um, throughout the, the seminar today, please also put those down in the chat box or email me directly. And um, I'll be monitoring that and I'll be here on hand to support you if you experience any issues with, with the, the technical side of Zoom during the session. And finally, just before introducing Keith, um, I'd just like to re reiterate that we are recording this morning's session. Um, and the purpose for this is because we will be sharing this seminar along with all of the other webinars in our Curious in a Crisis program on the Curious Minds uh, website once this season of webinars is finished, so you can all access the content at a later date. So I think that's um, all of the stuff that kind of the, the logistical side that I need to get through this morning. So I'd now like to um, welcome and introduce uh, Keith, Keith Arrowsmith. Um, Keith is a fully qualified solicitor and he's worked in a range of different law firms over the years. So I think it's, it's fair to say uh, we're in safe hands with Keith this morning. Good morning, Keith. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's lovely to have you with us. Um, Good morning. Would well, you mind? It's it's always a bit of a shame to do it this way, but you know, that's, that's uh, needs must and it'd be lovely to uh, uh, touch base with some of the people online um, as we go through those discussions, just as you said, so we make it as, as really focused as we can, given we've got the hour together. Wonderful, that's great, thank you. So before we kind of move into to that main part of the session, would you mind just giving us a, a bit of an idea of kind of um, who you are and, and your background and, and if Grace wouldn't mind also just giving a quick intro of herself as well, that would be fabulous. Sure. Uh, so, uh, yes, I am Keith and I am fully qualified solicitor. I was a sector um, for about 20 years and during that time I have focused on um, the world of intellectual property and how that works online. So th this is my kind of home turf, working with arts organisations, galleries, theatres, museums and people in the education sector in bringing young people through those processes. I've set up a national college to help with apprenticeships in the sector, and I've also dealt with the very smallest arts organisations, and I've tried to help practically to apply the kind of rules and regulations that we all experience on a day-to-day -day basis in a way that actually suits us, the sector, uh, and slightly broader uh, appeal. So um, I spend my time setting up organisations, helping them pull together the governance of these kinds of situations in a way that suits, and that goes from large for local authorities all the way down to um, arts organisations like Kitchen Sink Live in Liverpool, which consists of two practitioners. So we'll try and use that kind of experience I'm trying to give you some of those um, horror stories that we've come across in the past and we'll gather together your thoughts and produce a PDF to share at the end of the session. Now I'm joined with one of my colleagues, Grace. She's a trainee solicitor who's been working with me um, on some of these kind of projects in the past. So, so Grace, do, do you want to just say hi? Hello. I'm Grace, I'm based in the Manchester office with Keith. Um, I'm the newest trainee and I'm just trying to learn as much as I can from Keith, especially his particular brand of making difficult legal concepts really palatable for everybody. So uh, with that in mind, what I thought I'd like to do is just start the process of thinking about web law by putting in a bit of context. Now, lots and lots of people think that the law that applies to websites feels very different. And I think some of that's because we're still getting used to how we work together online. And obviously, since we've been getting used to all these wonderful new technologies, um, whilst we haven't been able to meet in person, I think that learning curve's got slightly steeper for us. But there are some rules and regulations that apply to us because we are working in the UK. There's some rules and regulations because of the work in the UK. And there's some specific things about dealing with things on the internet that we need to take account of. Some of that feels more complicated because we're trying to apply the rules and regs 
to what could be an international audience. Uh, we, websites are able to reach out to people at any time of the day and wherever they happen to be. So some of the things that have been happening in the background are the rule, trying to find a way of matching the rules and regulations that work here with rules and regulations that work all around the world. And, if, and, and once we've got our head around that, I suspect we'll then have to start thinking about how rules and regulations are going to work um, up in space, on the moon, on Mars, who knows? So yeah, there's still more work to be done on this. But for us, as a starting point, I think the first question we get asked is, who are we talking to online? And given the sector that we're working in, that, that transparency and that credibility is something that comes to the law, but it also helps us work with our colleagues and potential clients and customers. So when I first look at a website, especially if I'm working with a funder, I'm looking at the website thinking, who am I talking to? Do I know the business that sits behind this website? And it may be that you're used to working on your own as a sole trader, as a freelancer, and that must be the simplest, cheapest, easiest way of working. And um, you know, that can come across on the website. It may be that you need to work in collaboration with others, or it might be that you need a more formal structure for, for larger projects. And that's where using some of the other vehicles like companies and partnerships come into play. And if you're choosing to go down those routes, then again, we need a level of transparency that sits behind those kinds of business structures. And we can get more sophisticated if we need to. So that's where we come to charities, social enterprises, associations. Yeah, but there are lots and lots of structures for work and how we interact with each other. And the first thing we need to do is make sure that our structure supports the work you want to do online. It may be absolutely the way that you're used to working, but it might not. So maybe now's the time to just do that double check and to make sure that your business structure is the right one for the online world. Once we know the business structure, then we need to decide who are we talking to. So, and by that I mean, are you someone who wants to work with other individuals? And are we working with those individuals as consumers or as other business practitioners? And that distinction is something that becomes really important when we get to talking about the rules and regulations, because some rules only apply if we're working with consumers and some rules only apply if we're in business working with others. And you might have come across the terminology B2B or B2C, and that's that shorthand for business to business arrangements or business to consumer B2C arrangements. So we've got kind of a sense of who's behind the website and we get a sense of who's looking at the website. And with those two things settled, we can then move forward to start thinking about the rules and regulations that apply. So where do we start? Well, I think for most people, that interaction online often starts uh, in, a, in an internet search, trying to find you on the internet. And that's where being clear about your name, your brand, becomes really important because if people can't find your website, what's the point? And I'm sure that um, you're used to looking up domain names and you're used to finding people's websites using those internet searches. So kind of reverse the process and think a little bit about how will your colleagues, customers, clients find your website. And some of that's about picking the right domain name. Some of that's about putting up the right information for individuals to be able to read and some of it 
is about putting up the right information for computers to read so that things like the Google search algorithm can use your information to categorize it, to present it back to people doing those searches. And part of that is going to be picking the right name for, for your work. And I think most of us are tempted just to use our own individual name because that's how people know us and they trust us. And that's absolutely fine. But some of us have names that are shared by really famous people. And then it becomes a right pain because any Google search will find the famous people with all their time and energy and team uh, to promote their uh, work on the net rather than promoting ours. So sometimes choosing that name is one of the most important things for you. So we've got a sense of the website, we've got the sense of how we're going to brand our work and you can check to make sure that you're not going to be stepping on anyone else's toes by doing some searches online, checking the domain names that are available, checking the social media accounts that are available, but also checking the branding that's in use already. And there's a website that's run by the government, the Intellectual Property Office, which records all of the registered brands that are, are in use at the moment. And you may get in trouble for picking a brand for similar services. So if anyone's already registered similar goods and services, you mustn't compete with them. That's where you can um, find yourself in receipt of a letter from a sneaky lawyer like me saying stop it or else because of that danger of confusion between your work and existing brands work. So having thought about the website, the branding, the domain, and how they all link together, we come to our first real bit of law. And the law says that you must be transparent about who you are if you're providing a website that provides goods and services for people to buy. And that's the set of regulations that's been in place for a very, very long time and has adapted over the, over the years to make sure it's relevant for us today. So the things that you must, must say on your website and on any other publications that are produced by you in this kind of business setting will include um, the name of the person or the organisation that's behind the website. And if that's a freelancer, that means your name, because we need to identify the legally responsible person or organisation that sits behind the website. So we must display the name of the legal entity that's publishing the details on the website for, a, for someone who's working on their own, sole trader, freelancer, that's going to be their name. We also have to give a physical lesson. And if you're a company or a registered partnership, then, then it's going to be your registered name and registered number. We also give our electronic contact details for all those registration numbers that you might have picked up on the way. So that includes company numbers, VAT numbers, charity numbers, those, those kind of registrations so that you're being as transparent as you possibly can to make all of that clear. So I'm just going to ask Grace to come in now and just to say, Grace, that, that's all the legal stuff, but it may be that the freelancer or sole trader uses a brand or uses a kind of trading name. It's, it, it, you know, how, how does that fit in with those legal rules and regulations? So you can have your trading name on your website, but if you are working under a trading name, then you have to make sure that you also put your own name so that, as Keith said, um, people using the website can see the legal person behind it. You need to make sure as well that you are contactable. So that could be an email address or a phone number and you need um, a physical address on there as well that you can be written or that you can receive post art. Great. So it, that's, that's the first set of rules that ensures 
that transparency with the world. So just thinking about everyone else who's, who's uh, uh, involved in the webinar today, um, is, does that feel okay? Does that level of connection, that level of transparency work for you? Or do you think that's going to cause some concern because you're using your home address or you're using your own personal name? So it, it kind of can work both ways. It can be a really good selling point because people want to work with you. They, you know, they know about your reputation and the quality of your work. And that's why they found you and want to work with you. But on the other hand, that you, you're putting out the wide world about, about you and and the work that you work on. Any questions, any comments, stick it in the chat box for us and we'll be able to pick that up as we go along. So that kind of transparency about who you are and what you do. We've also got to be transparent about the way that you conduct your business. We've got to put online a way of people finding our terms and conditions, our business sale terms and conditions. Now, it may be that the way that you do business is really you need to do is tell people about your payment terms and how people interact with you on that way if you're conducting those kinds of transactions online. And that's absolutely fine if it's simple. But most people also talk around um, their pricing, uh, the tax that's payable, and again, VAT might well be something that gets changed in the next few weeks, uh, depending on uh, what the government's saying about bringing people back into work and spending. If, if there's any delivery fees for anything that's physical that needs to uh, be sent out as part of your business, and um, some really clear details if you're offering any special deals or anything like that to make sure that people aren't confused in the ways that you you want to do business if you're using your website to conclude a transaction so people are actually coming to your website to buy your goods and services then we've also got to have a standard way of confirming those emails those email orders as online transactions and that confirmation can be as simple as sending back an email or it could be automated and lots and lots of standard website packages allow you to automate that process and have a shopping cart with a payment structure built in that happens automatically and sends out the confirmations of those purchasing transactions for you. But either way, whether it's by hand or by machine, that mechanism, so it's clear when someone has transacted with you and that transaction has been completed. So, so that clarity about you and the work that you're doing online needs to be in place in order for us to make sure that all those rules and regulations are met with. Now, that sounds like you're gonna handle lots and lots of information. And of course, you'll need to store some of that information in order for you to be able to talk to your customers and clients and colleagues so that's when i hope that data protection gdpr bell ringing and you find ways of making sure that the information that you're gathering and the information that you're using is going to be kept safe and secure and you're being clear about the ways that you'll use that information in the future now it may be that you only receive the information to use in order for you to provide your services. And that's a really simple model. But the best practice nowadays is to show on your website that privacy statement, making sure you know, make it clear that that's all you'll use the information for. Now it may be that you need to share that information with other people in order for you to be able to supply your services and that's absolutely fine too as long as we're being clear and people are consenting to it. So a typical set of terms and conditions also includes that extra information about um, 
collection of data, cookies, and the rest of those technical elements that make sure that you know, you're not going to receive anything that then gets used in a way that is unclear or unauthorized. So a little bit around the data and the collection of all of that to make sure that, again, it helps enhance your reputation and it helps people understand that you are someone who can be trusted to trade with, as well as kind of the underlying rules and regulations on GDPR that helps um, you comply with the regs. So with that kind of background, what needs to happen if we are um, using the website to sell our goods or services online, especially if those are goods or services that have some kind of connection to a consumer. So that might be you know, teaching online, for example, providing, um, you know, I, I, I've been looking at lots and lots of musicians who have been starting to use these online platforms, um, either for monthly subscriptions or for one-to-one, -one, one-off sessions. And either way, we've got to comply with the Consumer Rights Act. And that's the set of rules and regs that says you must, as a business, look after consumers. Because we assume consumers, especially young consumers, aren't very sophisticated and they won't understand things. So they, they, they need to be protected to a level to make sure that they know how these transactions are going to work. Now, business to business arrangements, that's slightly different. So when you're in business, you're assumed to know what the rules are and you're assumed to read the rules and regulations and the terms and conditions and understand them. Now, whether that's right or wrong, or whether we all do the same and just tick the box to say that we've read the terms and conditions in business, that's your risk and that's up to you but as a can know that they don't read all the terms and conditions and we know that consumers have difficulty with really complicated legally phrased terms so let's make sure that we've got processes in place to help them again it's good practice helps helps look after your customers but it also helps make sure that you're complying with the rules and regulations so first thing if you are going to use a platform online to start these kinds of transactions, you're going to have to make sure that you've got a secure platform for receiving that detail, especially payment details online. And you'll know that it's a proper process if your website has that little padlock sign in the top bar. That, that says to the outside world, you've had a certificate on your website that says it's secure. They're called SSL certificates and almost all website providers, especially if you're using a, a platform like Shopify or, in, or, or the kind of Instagram, Facebook type shops, they'll have that built into their systems. If you've used a website designer to help you get online, it may be that you need to check with your website designer on whether that certificate is in place. But that little padlock in the top bar, in the search bar, gives us that indication that it's secure and, and complies with the certification. It also means that Google will show your website in search responses rather than hiding it for being something that they're not sure about, whether they're, they, they're not sure it's secure enough. So always good practice to make sure that the certificates in place to make sure that you're you're appearing in all of your searches. You also have to have a think about whether you're going to be reaching out to potential people overseas because so far we've been talking about the rules and regs for here uh, for, for people who are based in England and Wales but as we know the people in America do things slightly differently People in mainland Europe do things slightly differently. And those things are going to change over time, especially when we get the trade deals and Brexit arrangements in place. So it may be that you want to restrict the type of work that you're doing just to the UK. It may be 
that you are more than happy to work on an international basis. So local consumer protection regs will also kick in and you may need to do some things in, in those overseas jurisdictions to make sure your website is compliant. And that example, having to register with the local chambers of commerce. So small steps, but you need to know what they are. And the DTI have website arrangements that help spell out those arrangements for the particular countries. Um, it may be that everything you're doing is online. It may be you need to send things out. And if you're including delivery and postal arrangements, you need to make sure that those are clear as part of that pricing process. Because the last thing we want is for you to agree a price for a job and then find out that the profits are all being spent on postage and delivery. So just, just think a little bit about how you present the work that you want to do and be clear about the pricing mechanisms. And last, make sure that you're happy with it, but also your insurers are happy with it. Most businesses have some kind of uh, insurance arrangement that sits behind them. If nothing else, I think we're all used to having public liability insurance. But obviously when you're working online, that connection is slightly different and some insurance policies limit the work that you can do online unless you pay an extra premium. So worth checking insurance policies to see what's covered and what's not for the online world. If you are delivering services online, you might have to give a period for people to change their mind. Sometimes it's called a cooling off period or time when someone can return goods back to you if they don't want them. Now that 14 day cancellation process is automatic. Every consumer is allowed to have that cancellation process unless you're producing things that are bespoke, they're customised. So, for example, if you are commissioned to create a piece of work and you create the piece of work, then that can't be cancelled because you can't resell it on to someone else. So if it's customised, if it's bespoke, then, then the cancellation process is different. Or if it's sealed goods or perishable goods, obviously the 14 day cancellation period doesn't work. Or if they ask you to start work during the 14 days. So if someone is saying, I want to start work with you online and have our first music lesson on Friday, that's absolutely fine. They can't then go through the first music lesson on Friday and then say, oh, well, but that's within our 14 day cancellation period. We're not going to pay you. If they've asked for the services during the 14 days, they must pay for them, but they can cancel anything else in the future. So just, just be a little bit careful about that first 14 days to make sure that you're not committing to something um, that can then be uh, cancelled and then you are left out of pocket. So there is that kind of overview of making sure that there's a clarity to the, that online world. And some of it's just because for some people, we know it's going to be unfamiliar. So helping people through that process and having that arrangement in place so that we can see how it works online, given that your website will be a little bit different to other people's websites. Your transactions will be a little bit different to other people's transactions. Having it upfront and clear must be the best way forward. You can't say in your terms and conditions anything that is so unfair to a consumer that it shouldn't be allowed. And the regulations say you must act fairly at all time and they ban anything that's misleading or aggressive in its sale practices. Now, I'm sure that's not your, the way that you want to work, but sometimes things are misleading by mistake. And sometimes it's just by using really odd, difficult words that we're not used to using 
uh, in day-to-day -day practice. You know, who knew that we'd all be talking about furloughing you know, a few weeks ago? That, that's a word that most of us never came across um, in day-to-day -day practice, but it's become something that feels much more familiar now. And there are other legal terms that people might not be familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis, really important, especially in a period of lockdown. So here's the grace. Um, some of these terms and conditions include something that's called force majeure, which is a really odd phrase. So come on, Grace, tell us, tell us what that means. What, what would a force majeure term and condition do? Why, why would we put it in a set of terms and conditions? So force majeure is a really old French word um, and it essentially describes what's known as an act of God. So that could be something like a flood or a hurricane um, or the country goes to war. It's something that's out of control of the parties. And the reason why we would put that clause into a contract or into terms and conditions is so that if this force majeure or this really unexpected, uncontrollable act happens, the parties have a way of dealing with that and dealing with possibly the breakdown of the contract or the breach of the terms and conditions. Great. So let, um, I'm going to play Let's Pretend with Grace now. And again, if there's any of these things that you want me to go into in more detail, or we want to talk about your specific arrangements, just let us know in the chat. Let's play, let's pretend. So Grace, let's pretend that um, you are going to offer music lessons online. And let's pretend you haven't got anything in your terms and conditions about circumstances that are outside of your control. And let's say that we've booked our first session on Friday, but when we come to Friday, your internet doesn't work. Would you have to give me my money back or would you be able to keep it using a sneaky lawyer term and condition? Um, I, I have a feeling I could use a sneaky lawyer term and condition. <laughs> So it's, it's a hard one, isn't it? Because your heart, your heart says, of course we shouldn't keep the money. You know, we can't, we can't provide our service. But on the other hand, it's not your fault that you can't provide the service. It's your internet provider that's causing you the hassle. So that's why we end up in these really difficult positions where it's not entirely clear what needs to happen next. Let's do another example. I've, I've booked my session with Grace on Friday, but at Thursday at five to midnight, I email Grace and say, oh, I've been invited to a barbecue. I don't want to do the lesson anymore. Is, Grace, do you think you can still take the money in that situation? Um, well, that's not a situation that's out of control of the parties. Yeah. That's a decision that somebody's made to change the terms and conditions that have already been agreed to and the kind of contract that you've already entered into to deliver the services on that specific day. So I think at five to midnight on the day before, then you would be keeping me because it doesn't seem fair to vary it at that late point. So again, I think we get a sense of it would be fair to ask someone to give you a little bit of notice if they needed to cancel or postpone a session and what period that might be for your business will be depending on all sorts of different factors but if we've put something on the website to make the cancellation arrangements really clear then hopefully you're going to avoid lots of difficult conversations with your customers and clients in the future so there are times where Having a more sophisticated website that sets out some of the information about how you want to work. If someone gives you a week's notice, then you can always find something else to do in that slot. It's absolutely fine. But if they only give you five minutes notice, then obviously necessarily find a replacement piece of work. So think around 
how you want to make your connection with your customers and clients as simple as it can be, but as clear as it can be. And think about what happens if they want to cancel, what happens if you want to cancel, and what happens if actually you've got to cancel because of the circumstances that are outside of your control and put those details into the website terms and conditions so everyone knows what, where to go next. Lots of websites have standard terms and conditions and that's because you don't want to be having the same conversation with absolutely every one of your um, customers. And sometimes it helps having standard terms because you want to pitch the level of your payments, your fees, in a way that doesn't have to need a whole team of people in an office helping put together the packages. On the other hand, you might be a very famous artist that has a huge great big team behind them and is able to do each commission on a bespoke basis. So again, it depends on what's gonna be working for you, but as a starting point, I think there are some things in those standard terms conditions that can help provide that framework on how you work on a day-to-day -day basis. It may be you need some helpline email contact form to help say to potential jobs, get in touch with us if there's something that doesn't work for you, something that needs more explanation, or you put FAQs or similar onto the website to help people understand how you work, how you get paid and all the rest of it that goes with it. Think also about any guarantees that you want to give about your work, especially if it's physical delivery of anything. You know, how long should it be a fit, fit for the job? How long will you promise to replace it if it goes wrong? You know, those kinds of guarantees need to be really clear from the outset. And lastly, as I've said before, you may be getting to the point where your VAT registers, in which case those VAT details and the VAT rules about how you invoice and charge for the VAT kick into play, whether you like it or not. That gives us a kind of sense of using the website for business and for transactions and dealing with customers. And as I said at the beginning, it will only ever be any good if people can find the website. So it might be that you need to enter into contracts with other businesses to help you spread the good word about your goods and services. And that's where using keywords for search engine sites, Google AdWords, the similar things on other social media platforms, or even we're finding more and more that people are talking to Instagram influencers and people who've got lots and lots of followers who can help promote your websites. But all of that is controlled. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it's controlled, but there are rules that are set by the Advertising Standards Authority that apply equally to things that are published in newspapers and magazines, to billboards, to websites. So again, be clear about what you're offering and how they're being advertised to make sure that all of those recommendations and best practice are being followed. A part of that will be if you're building up a database, a marketing newsletter arrangement, then making it really easy for people to know it's from you and they know it's yeah, easy to unsubscribe. And all of those things help us show that if ever anyone makes complaints about the way that you do business, that you've had a proper process in place and you can show that you've had a proper process in place to make sure that you can handle those marketing emails and unsubscribe requests in a very efficient way. Now, I had, a, I had a think around any specific arrangements that you might need to take into account that's over and above 
the kind of standard things I'd expect any business to look at. And I think there is one or two elements for you. Um, the first might be that you might be using material that's been produced by somebody else. And it might be that you're using you know, music that's been written by somebody else or graphics, photographs or text that's been produced by somebody else to create either your website or the services that you're providing from your website. And if you're using other people's material or even you want to reproduce things that are um, created by your clients and customers, you've got to be really clear that you've got permission to do that. And that's kind of intellectual property rules and regs. And there's another webinar tomorrow to help go through the detail of that. So for today, let's just flag, it's going to be important to make sure you've got permission to use that material on your website. Because if it appears on your website, then you're going to be responsible for it. Now, Grace and I, we've, we've had to deal with some situations where photographs, images have been used on websites uh, without permission. Great, can you remember one that we've, we've, we've had to do where someone's got caught? Um, I think somebody used a photograph from, um, they haven't taken it from another person, but they've taken it from another company where it was on a database for photographs and you had to get permission to use the photograph from the database, which they didn't do. So the company that owned the database then got in touch with uh, the person that we were working with and said that unless they paid a license fee, which would give them permission to use the work, they would have to take the work down. And how much were, how much were they threatening that they would have to pay to fix it? Um, I think it was a couple of hundred pounds because they hadn't gone and got the license initially it wouldn't have been as much if they had got permission in the first place but because they'd done it without permission then there was extra fees on top and i think that's that's the point we want to make today that it sometimes feels very easy to just grab a stock image one of these from one of the online libraries those kind of database databases of uh, imagery uh, uh, to use on your website but, but they, people do get caught on a daily basis if they haven't got the right permissions. And sometimes it's even more difficult because it's the website designer, it's the friend who's helped put together the website that didn't realise about these terms and conditions of use for other people's material. And all of a sudden it's the business website that gets, um, uh, gets the letter and has to deal with that kind of arrangement where they have to spend lots of time and energy sorting out a claim for lots and lots um, about those kinds of um, uh, uh, invoices that come through for after the event, which we can avoid if we do it properly at the beginning. So user-generated material or material that's created by anyone else that you want to include on your website needs to be cleared. Um, second one is if your website is aimed at young people or vulnerable people, you're going to have to go through extra steps to make sure that it's appropriate for that audience. And certainly, you know, people will take a few um, year olds and once you're a teenager, there's, a, there's an extra level of understanding about how websites work and the rest of it. But you and I know that safeguarding has got to take precedence over everything else. And if you're involved on a one-to-one -one session, just how you can protect yourself, as well as making sure that you're doing as much as you can to protect the children. So keep that in mind. Who, who is looking at the website and how do we make sure that that's right? There's a new guidance that's just been published uh, this month about what the expectations are for businesses who are dealing with young people online and how do we flag up those important points on safeguarding. So the law does move on, things do change over time. Sometimes it's quite slow, but you know, we do need to keep an eye on making sure that what we thought was right when we put our websites together is still right 
you know, months afterwards. So keep, keep an audit of that kind of chain of changes that you might make to the website so that if ever you get a complaint about something that might have gone wrong six months ago, you can still prove what was said on your website six months ago. It's, it's having that audit trail together just in case there's been a historical problem. Uh, and last thing I was going to talk about is streaming and online contact like, like this, because I think, again, it feels very new. And it feels as though it's a real opportunity for us all to get it right. But again, if it's streamed content, have you got permission for it to be streamed? Have you got, it, uh, have you got permission for it to be used? And do you want it to be used uh, for purposes that are broader than just today's event? And I think that's, that's a big question because you don't want to remove the possibility of people paying for your time in the future if actually they can go on YouTube and see you giving the specialist advice or help or assistance for free on YouTube. So sometimes, you know, make sure you're keeping your valuable things close, close to your heart. So with that in mind, and given we've only got five, five, ten minutes left, um, I was just going to say, if, if there's anything else that uh, you'd like to touch on, now's the time to ask. You've got access to a free, free session with a lawyer. Who, how, who knew that lawyers did stuff for free? Um, but and again, any of those general points, more than happy to, to cover today. If it's specific legal advice, we'll have to have another session because we've got only a few minutes left. But and anything there that we want to cover before we disappear for today, do, do let us know. Um, and I will make sure that I produce that PDF of that kind of short list of things to check against, um, which Hannah will, will have available for you all. If, if actually just, just having those notes available um, will, will help you through. And if having looked at the notes, there's something there that you're not quite sure about, um, you, you'll be able to make contact and we'll, we'll, sure, but we'll make sure that we're signpost you to something that will be of help for you. So that, there you go, Hannah. Is there anything you can think of, Hannah, that, that would be good to just touch base on before we finish the session, or you, do? Um, well, th thank you very much, Keith. Yes, uh, I have got a couple of questions that have come through to me. Um, as Keith has, has just said, if there, there are any questions that um, you, you want to ask directly, I think you'd probably be happy, Keith, for people to kind of um, just take it in turns and unmute the microphones now and kind of ask you directly. Um, but if there's nobody who wants to jump in right away, I'm just going to have a quick look. Um, I can't see any raised hands or or muting of microphones at the moment. But as I say, if, if you do want to ask a question, please just take the opportunity to do that. Um, but I do have a couple of questions that I have, have come in and written down here. Um, so the first one to put to you um, is uh, around, I know you were just mentioning then about um, kind of trying to keep up to date and making changes to your website and, and following that audit trail there. Uh, but one of the questions that, that came in that I guess kind of touches upon this a little bit is how can people stay updated with those changes in, in web law or ongoing, I guess? Yeah, well, it's, it's the classic problem that um, the world keeps changing. And as we know from the kind of lockdown guidance, things, things can change on a really quick basis. And I think we've got, we know that as we get closer to the Brexit arrangements, there will be a time of change. What's expected of us on websites will change and it may happen really quickly. It may take years to get sorted out and we just don't know. So how, how do you get connected with these kind of things? Well, um, there are some governments that help and produce those kind of, you can subscribe to those kind of updates. There are some um, websites that are set up for particular sectors as well that will help for that. So things like um, the Charity Commission provides specific guidance for working with charities. Um, there are things like local um, uh, groups that, that, that help particular sectors. So here I happen to be in Sheffield and Sheffield has a guild of freelancers that work in our sector and they produce updates uh, for, for people who are members of the guild. And then there's, there's, there's other kind of more general 
um, membership organisations that you can join too. Um, there are professionals, uh, other law firms and accountants that have systems that enable those kind of updates uh, to come out on a regular basis. And, um, they, you know, and a simple search of Google will get you halfway there. But I always urge a little bit of caution because just because you find it on Google doesn't necessarily mean it's true. It might be out of date or it might be advice or guidance that's more appropriate to people in America or elsewhere. So always just you know, take that with a little bit of a pinch of salt and double check things before just relying on stuff that's on the internet. Um, we, you know, it, it, it tends to be um, a worry that that kind of updating process will cost lots and lots of money. But what we've found in the past is that kind of sort of um, broad approach that's using lots and lots of resources um, and keeping a, a, you know, a weather eye out on what needs to happen is a really useful way of doing it. Um, one freebie website that I've used a lot for small businesses is something called Donuts Law. And again, I'll, I'll provide, well, Grace, if you wouldn't mind just looking it up while I'm talking and sharing the, the link for that, that might help people. So it's, it's called Donuts Law, and there's several donuts websites, and one's for new startup businesses, and one's specifically about employment law. Um, but they, they are kept up to date, and they produce that kind of easy access to some of that information going forward. And they're not particularly affiliated to, to any particular professional body or, or, or group. Um, so that, that's one I think is a, is, is a really useful source of that kind of initial uh, feed through. There we go, lawdonut.co.uk and they have a special business section on there. So thanks Grace. Perfect, thank you. So yeah, there, there are actually plenty of options out there, it's just knowing where to find them and obviously as you say double checking with some of them. <laughs> Um, I think we've got time for just one final question uh, just before wrapping up. Um, although I'm not sure actually whether Keith's internet connection, unfortunately, has just gone down. Um, Keith, are you still with us? Perfect. Oh, yes. um, so very, very quickly, because we're quite um, quickly approaching 11 o'clock. So just um, if very quickly before we head off, um, the last question we have is do web designers, I suppose some some practitioners and some organisations may be uh, employing a third party web designer to create their website. So the question we've got here is around or do or should, well I imagine they should, but do web designers know about the, the kind of those legalities around web law and, and I guess can you check that with them? So um, a good web designer should be up to date with these things. Some web designers try and keep the arrangements with their customers really simple but often that means that the arrangements are in the web designer's favour because unless you agree specific terms anything that the web designer creates they they will have control over and that's maybe not what you want going forward so the quick answer is ask that question and say can you promise that the website that you're designing for us will be compliant, especially around accessibility. You know, wh why would you want to put a website online nowadays that doesn't meet proper accessibility standards? But lots of designers take shortcuts and don't do that properly. So ask for those specific promises. Are we sure we know where the website's gonna be hosted? Are we sure we know how the data is going to be handled and stored? Do we know where they're going to get the graphics, the photos, the imagery, the text from? How are we going to handle translations if that's important to you? you know, lots of people uh, I work with work in Wales and having a Welsh translation is sometimes one of the promises they've made for their funders. So th think around those kind of specific promises that it will be good for you to be able to to have and get that sorted out or you hand over any money and once you know you've got those promises in place that then you'll be able to make sure that what's delivered will be worth the money great 
Lovely. Thank you very much for that. Um, it looks like we're just about out of time now, so I'm afraid we're going to have to, to wrap up today's session. But just thank you once again to, to both Keith and Grace for hosting today's session. Um, I know lots of us have been furiously scribbling down notes throughout that session. Um, just some final things to everyone who's still with us um, at the moment. We're following today's session, as I say, this uh, webinar, along with the others, will be um, the recording of today's session will be put on the Curious Minds website at a later date for you, so you can always access the content at a later date. Um, we will be sending um, a quick evaluation through, so if you could take a couple of moments just to kind of provide us with a bit more feedback um, on today's session, that will really help us for, for the content that we provide and, and deliver in future sessions. Um, and as Keith has mentioned, he's, he's created a PDF, a handy PDF for you that we can send out to you follow up with so you've got access to that resource and, and as and when you need it but apart from that thank you very much for joining us today I know a few of us might have experienced a few issues with with internet and um, so apologies for that but thank you very much for, for sticking with us throughout today's session and um, apart from that we hope to, to see you all again soon at, at upcoming sessions with us and um, if you'd just like to, to leave today's session by clicking on the there's a, a leave tab at the, the bottom of the window there and uh, yeah that's it that we'll we'll see you again soon thank you very much for everyone take care